All right, so good morning, everybody. Welcome to lecture six of uh, Mathematical Methods part two. So we have uh, been talking about representation theory. And uh, one of the, the questions that came up at the end of uh, the last lecture was, why are we doing this? What is the, what is the point of, of doing all this? So uh, the same question can be asked of, of any of the other topics in this class, right? So for instance, you study complex analysis and uh, special functions and uh, series solutions of differential equations. So what is the, or what is the point of studying all of those? I mean, so complex analysis, for instance, right, is something that you can use uh, for various, various purposes, such as finding, such as integrating uh, expressions which are not integrable. Otherwise, you can extend uh, uh, the variable of integration into the complex plane. Right? And using Cauchy's theorem, in many cases, you can uh, perform that integral. Do you use complex analysis very frequently in physics? Well, again, it depends on what sort of physics you're doing. Right? Uh, uh, what about special functions? Special functions? Well, special functions are uh, most commonly uh, used to represent solutions of various different kinds of differential equations. Now, in order of usefulness in terms of uh, the application in the broadest possible sense, of course, not all of these topics are equivalent. For instance, uh, special functions and series solutions, these are more more useful, more uh, widely used than complex analysis. And complex analysis is more widely used than group theory. So, I mean, it is true to a certain extent that, that group theory uh, is uh, not as widely applicable as these other topics. But uh, there are certain uh, uh, subjects, such as certain problems, which can only be addressed with the use of group theory. So let me just mention uh, one of those applications and I'll mention it because, well, uh, it is what I am most familiar with, but there are many applications. Let me list a couple of applications. So just to, just to you know, uh, satisfy your curiosity. So the most common application of group theory is in crystallography, right? And that is the study of the structure of crystals. And why is this the case? Well, it's because Every so this is the let's say the lattice the crystal lattice of some of some element or some compound, right? And so this is this is a what kind of a, this is a cubic lattice, right? Then you can have other kinds. You can have face-centered cubic, body-centered cubic, uh, hexagonal, uh, tetragonal, right? So the question becomes: Is there an infinite number of such possible? Uh, uh, so the question is, how many uh, 
different types of crystals exist right so this question is answered by group theory uh, why is that because each one of these crystals has a symmetry right so and these the the symmetry of a crystal is known as a what is called a point group right so what sort of symmetries are these so you these are combinations of uh, translations of rotations right you can also have reflections and uh possibly inversions so for instance what is the uh, translational uh, symmetry of uh, the cubic lattice right so the translational symmetry is easy easy to see from from this picture right if you go in this either one of these directions by one step right you end up the you end up at the same place so to speak right because if you are in a uniform infinite lattice each uh, lattice point is equivalent to every other so the symmetry tells you how do you go from one lattice point to another right what about rotations same thing right i can uh, rotate in this plane right or i can rotate in this plane and then there is a third rotation in the plane that is uh, hiding right so these are three discrete rotations then you can have reflections for instance you can have a you can have a you can have a reflection along along an axis like this such an axis you can have uh so so you have various axes of symmetry right and these axes of symmetry they depend on the on the lattice in question right so it turns out that there is a finite number of of lattices and there's a finite number of point groups and group theory gives you a complete classification of all the point groups okay then okay so what else is this is it useful for in terms of crystal crystallography it is useful for uh so once you know the the crystal structure right uh this leads to uh x-ray uh uh crystallograph crist well x-ray crystallography is the thing so what happens is uh, that when you have uh some kind of a crystal when you have some kind of a lattice okay and uh, you how do we probe a lattice right we you can you can you can shine some light on it for instance right so you you can you can send in some you can send in some waves right these can be these are generally x rays why x rays because the wavelength of the x ray uh is of the order of the lattice spacing right which is of the order of uh, angstroms right so this is required to probe the structure and what happens when you uh,
when this when the, when the light comes out from the other side what do you see right well this is a this is a screen right and on this screen what what you see is a diffraction pattern right so a diffraction pattern can look like this for instance right this is a diffraction pattern and so this is what happens in the case of a three dimensional crystal right where the dots represent the intensity of the light right where where the light falls how intense it is so by by examining the diffraction pattern by examining the symmetries of the diffraction pattern you can determine the symmetric group of the crystal right so uh, what are the symmetries of the diffraction pattern right so for instance if you have a diffraction pattern which which looks like this right so light is falling on a screen and uh, the brightest spots uh, are placed in this way right what can you what does this tell you about the uh, about the possible symmetry of the lattice right so if you look at this diffraction pattern this has a six fold symmetry right six fold hexagonal right so right you can uh, reflect around you have three different axes of reflection uh, sorry so this is this is three no it's it's a six fold only so six fold symmetry right and so this tells you that your lattice should also have uh this six fold symmetry right so this is this is one application right obviously this is an important very important application uh very practical application then uh a somewhat less practical application but still very important is in uh understanding uh, elementary particles not just elementary particles but particles or excitations in um, in any in any substance okay not just elementary particles so i should not say any so i should call them quasi particles instead <clears throat> so what are quasi particles quasi particles are like for instance uh you have you have phonons right so phonons are a kind of quasi particle right because they are quanta of lattice vibrations so a quasi particle is something that arises due to the uh collective degrees of motion of any system um and so how how can what what can you say about uh, the phonons in any in any crystal well uh, they will have some sort of a, some sort of a spectrum right and they, will, they they can exist different bands different energy bands so whether you talk about phonons or you're talking about magnons or spinons right or about elementary particles also such as electrons uh neutrinos quarks and so on and so forth which the you can also think of elementary particles as as a kind of a quasi particle 
right so the the statement is uh, that whatever your, your system is it has some symmetry group right so for instance if you ask for elementary particles what is the symmetry group well elementary particles propagate on the space time right so what is a space time symmetry group right it consists of translations continuous translations now right rotations and boosts boosts are lorentz transformations right all three of these together they form something that is called the poincare group there is a accent over here poincare and so we say that elementary particles are rep correspond to rep uh, representations of this poincare group. or more precisely irreducible representations right so then you have other applications for instance um in 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 telecommunications you have coding theory right which is the theory of how to construct uh, how to encode or decode a message so there a group theory is important right uh, because uh, it allows you to study the structure of something known as elliptic curves and uh, these elliptic curves are what are what are what are used to uh, for for uh, encryption right so any any on uh, this thing communication that you do online is encrypted right more very often it is uh, using some form of elliptic curve cryptography right and again an understanding of the sorts of codes that you can have and whether a code is good or bad depends on group theory then what else is it good for it is it is very important and quantum information right so arguably this is the most important application in today's time right and so if you if you are um when you, when you when you study uh, this again here again there is a question of uh, there is a question of coding right or error correcting codes quantum error correcting codes right and these are very very important because because you have to be able to correct errors in any uh, in any computation right so how do you correct those errors you use something called a error correcting code right and the error correcting code uh, is also described by uh, some sort of group and its representations so uh, another example is in robotics okay now how does it how does how does group theory come into play in robotics right well in robotics uh what are we what are we concerned with we are concerned with uh, let's say let's say you have a mechanical arm right something like this let's say and you we are we are concerned with how how this arm can rotate and 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 move around 
right so so how how do you describe describe this motion you you describe it in terms of uh, rotations and translations in space right so for instance if you, if you have if my wrist moves like this right it is performing a rotation around some point if my elbow moves like this i'm performing a rotation around the hinge of the elbow right and why why is this important because uh, you want to understand in order for the robot to function efficiently you have to understand how to go from one configuration to another configuration right so this might be one configuration and another configuration might be uh, something else right so you want to uh, understand how to go from one one configuration to another configuration well such a change can be understood as a as a transformation under some group so again if you want to understand uh, it so it plays a role in in the theory of of robotics also okay so i i don't know to what extent this uh, satisfies you it probably doesn't because you are still thinking well this is too abstract and i don't need it for anything and in many cases you will probably be correct to be honest uh but we have a few more uh topics to go cover uh and then we can start talking about things like lie groups and lie algebras su2 so3 uh, and so on and so forth okay are there any questions okay all right so now the main main uh, question is how do we find oops finding all the irreducible representations of a group okay so for this purpose uh, there are uh, there are, are a couple of different uh, theorems and one lemma uh, that are required which we which i will state without proof one of them is called shoes lemma okay and shoes lemma is the is the following statement that given a group g right let's say that d of g and d prime of g are two different irreducible representations of this group right and they have so this is this is this is has a dimension d let's say and this has a dimension small d prime so this consists of a d this consists of d by d matrices and element and el elements in this representation consist of d prime by d prime matrices okay now we can ask the question are these representations related to each other in some way okay so let's say there is 
a d times d prime matrix a okay so this this is a this is a rectangular matrix which satisfies the following requirement so you have so let me write down the expression first and then i will tell you what it means so since this is a d times d prime uh, dimension matrix right what is the left hand side of this expression the left hand side of this expression is d of g now what is d of g d of g is a d times d dimensional matrix what is a a is a d times d prime dimensional matrix right so you can multiply these two because uh, the number of rows uh the number of columns in the first matrix is equal to the number of rows in the second matrix and so what do you get when you multiply these two right so when you multiply an m by n matrix with a n times l matrix what do you get you get an, you get an m by l matrix so this gives you another d times d prime matrix dimensional matrix right similarly here on the left hand side what we have is that a is a d times d prime matrix and d capital d prime is d prime by d prime dimensional matrix right and so when you multiply these two what do you get you get a d by d once again i need to um right so both of the the dimensions on both sides of the expression match okay so assumption is that there is one matrix of this kind which satisfies this expression for all elements of this okay so then shoes lemma says uh that there are only two possible uh two possible out sorry well two possibilities <laughs> the first is that these are in equal in equivalent representations okay so if these are inequivalent representations right so what what does this expression imply so if you look at this expression right now you take both sides of the equation and you multiply on the left by uh a inverse let's say what will you get you will get a inverse dg a is equal to d prime g right so the assumption is that a is invertible now what is this expression right this expression is is it looks like that of a similarity transformation only difference is that here a is not not an orthogonal matrix right it's a, because it's a well it could still be orthogonal yeah it could still be orthogonal because uh, yeah 
so if this is the case right so first of all if they are in equivalent representations then this is not possible right so this is these, these cannot be equal to each other because you remember that we explained uh, in the earlier lecture uh, that if you have two different representations and they are connected to each other by a by a similarity transformation then they are equivalent right so if i have two representations r and r prime they are connected by a similarity transformation these representations are equivalent the statement is that if this is not true right then uh, they are so okay so the point is that if they are in equivalent representations then a must be zero because there is no such matrix no matrix which which would take d of g into d prime g or vice versa because they are inequivalent okay the other possibility is that they are equivalent representations okay so they are equivalent representations now this expression we are saying is true it holds for all elements of the group right not just for one element but for all em elements of the group now so this is a similarity transformation right okay and so the that also requires that the determinant of a should not be zero right a should be non degenerate that the same thing is also true in in the first case it is true here also because if you have you are using a inverse so a should be non degenerate and so if these are the equivalent representations uh and let's say uh so one second is given oops Okay. So the statement is that if this is true and there is such a matrix and this is this matrix is exists for all elements uh, of the group right and also uh, uh, that these representations are are irreducible then this implies uh, that that a is equal to the identity
Okay. So this, there is uh, an application of this lemma, which is the following. It tells us the following that if you have an abelian group, all irreducible representations are one dimensional. Okay. So what, what does this mean and how do we see it from Schur's lemma? So what is an abelian group, right? An abelian group is one which satisfies this property for all elements of the group. Right. Is it that the group multiplication is commutative? Okay. Now, uh, now here, let's say we so how we can prove this. We pick one element, some element. G naught of G, right? Then we have the following, right? That so for all elements of the of the group, this is true. Where we have picked, we have fixed one of the elements in the in the previous expression. Okay, but we are assuming, uh, we have assumed that this is a irreducible representation, right? So then according to Schur's lemma, this is only possible. So that D of G naught is like this A matrix here. So according to Schur's lemma, this is only possible Right. Schur's lemma says that uh, D of G naught must be proportional to the identity matrix. And you, we can repeat this argument by taking G naught to be any other element of the group. And so this is true for all elements of, of the group, right? And since in this representation, all elements are proportional to the identity, are proportional to the identity matrix. So what that means is that every element at most looks like this. There is some, there is some phase factor e to the i theta times g. This is all you can have, right? Because you have proportionality to the identity matrix and that proportionality, this is the proportionality constant. It can only be some number, real or complex, right? And what the, so what this tells you is that the representation is reducible. Why is it reducible? Because the matrix looks like this, right? This is the matrix representation, right? This is the matrix. Now you can write this as the this is the direct sum of, of n, n one by one matrices, right? This is a one by one matrix, one by one matrix, one by one matrix. So you can write it as a direct sum. And let's say this is n by n 
of one dimensional what are presentations so it's reducible and the only irreducible representations will have simply one degree of freedom which is a which is a number so for an abelian group all irreducible representations are one dimensional right and this is this is an important result it might not seem very important but but it is okay um and here it is important to keep track of remember one thing that what what was the um Uh, what is what is the statement of uh, when when we say that uh, two representations are equivalent so let's just remind ourselves what this means right we have two two representations r and r prime and some unitary matrix right so what happens is that under the action of this unitary matrix you go from r to r prime in this way right um and then of course it's easy to show that r prime is also a representation of the group so uh what was i saying yeah, i'm a little bit confused anyway so i i i will stop here um because uh i think i think all men of you are really interested in what shoes like uh after shoes lemma there are a couple of other uh, topics uh but i don't think i'm going to i don't think i'm going to cover them because uh they don't necessarily um uh, they're not so important in the big scheme of things but for those of you who are interested in in understanding more about group theory i would suggest that you read about them and uh those topics are the orthogonality theorems one of them i've also may already mentioned there are two of them i mentioned one of them which is the character orthogonality there is a there is a first one uh which is important so you can you should study that uh then the concept of a regular representation and uh how to find the irreducible representations so when you combine these topics when you combine these this tells you collectively how to find all the irreducible representations of a group okay and i will leave it at that um in the in the next class i will consider one example right so so these are these are optional studying material for those who are interested in learning more about group theory next uh, i will look at one example which is the vibration of a triangular uh, molecule okay and so as you can imagine this is a molecule which uh, uh corresponds to three atoms connected in a 
equilateral shape and we are going to talk about its oscillations and it will turn out that the oscillations the solutions of the oscillations have something to do with the symmetry what is the symmetry it's the dihedral group and uh, this will give us information about uh, the allowed uh, oscillations uh, the allowed eigen vectors uh, of this system okay so all right i'm going to uh, leave that here leave it here for now um, and i will uh, see you in the next class okay are there any questions before i close the session no okay all right then i'll see you all on monday okay bye bye